Our journey begins high over the island country of Madagascar. Situated in the Indian Ocean, it is just off the southeast coast of Africa. Its capital, Antananarivo, lies at the heart of the island and is populated by close to 2 million people. It is a vibrant and lively city with deep colonial roots. Taking to the streets, with appropriate guidance, you can find a myriad of locally run cutting workshops and gem sellers. Though only a tiny fraction of Malagasy stones are actually cut in their own country, it is an emerging industry that, with support, will help add value to the stones before they are shipped out, thus helping to keep profits within the Malagasy community. Helping to forward this industry are people like Tahiri. Eager to learn and build his skills, Tahiri exemplifies this ideal. Working from his tiny one-room home, like many, he works hand-to-mouth, cutting what he can and using the profits to buy bigger and better rough gems. It is people like Tahiri who are the future for a better and more sustainable gem industry within Madagascar. I'm fresh. <laughs> yep. My name is uh, Tahiri. I'm from Madagascar. I'm cutting a stone uh, at uh, 20, 2008 and uh, I'm studying at HM. I study uh, at the uh, formation of uh, lapidary and gemology practice. After uh, I'm going uh, to work, work in Madagascar. After uh, I'm going to work uh, at uh, South Africa for uh, for give information uh, of all uh, handicap uh, like me. Yes, I have a good gem for cutting stones. If I if I cut in uh, a good stones, if I finish that, uh, I'm very happy. But uh, of course, your uh, your job is uh, is good. It's good. <laughs> Heading south from Antananarivo, we make our way to the township of Ensirabe. Though these main transit routes are of reasonable quality, it's still commonplace to see serious traffic accidents, especially during the rainy season. Ensirabe has a more relaxed feel in the capital. It is a minor trading hub for precious stones, and small workshops and traders dot the area. We've come to Antara Bay today to meet with a cutter. He's been cutting for about 20 years now, with small loans from sort of NGOs, buying up little bits of equipment, cutting out of small workshops like this, but doing some nice work and we'll go and have a look inside. And here we have this rather stunning showroom. Along with the small trading houses, there are a number of markets around in Surabe. These, however, are generally aimed more at tourists, but then again, you never know what you might find, and these areas are always worth a wander, if not just for a bit of fun. Heading back to the capital, we then have a short flight to the coast and the beach town known as Tamatav. With scooters being the preferred mode of transport, we make our way out into the surrounding low-lying mountains. And as you can see, we may have made a few friends along the way.
reaching the miner's base camp, they bring out what is said to be roughly a month's working from the area. It's a uh, white, uh, black tourmaline. It's black tourmaline. It's black tourmaline. Do you, do you cut this cabochon? Do you cabochon, cut this? Uh, sapphire. We then head out on a three hour trek to reach the initial mine. So we've, we've come to a barrel mine just about 10k outside of Tamatav. And you can see they're finding a pegmatite through weathered feldspar. And they've gone in about 10 meters down. But at the moment, as it's the rainy season, you can see it's very full of water at the moment. Yeah, so mine through big chunks of quartz. Nice big veins of mica here. You can see between biotite and muscovite. Mm -hmm. But um, you can see the contact zone between the intruding or the cooling pegmatite here. With a few samples gathered, it's back to the trail, this time on our way to an alluvial deposit. <laughs> As we approach the mine, we pass through an area that is actively being worked by a number of small artisanal mining groups. It is finished. It is black tourmaline. This is black tourmaline. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've come about maybe 18 kilometers north of Tamatav now, in a alluvial deposit, looking for sapphires here. Going down maybe one or two meters through the topsoil, there they'll find the gem-bearing gravel. Take it out of the hole, a little handheld jig here, and they'll be panning it. Hopefully they'll find sapphire, maybe a little bit of kyanite, tourmaline, a few associated minerals, but the, the general idea here is they're trying to find nice blues, pinks, good, good quality sapphire. It is comforting to know that there are mining groups such as this where it is so obvious that the relationships between the workers and those running the operation are solid and based on good models. <laughs> It is also encouraging to see that the mined areas have also been rehabilitated to some extent, with native brush ground cover and trees being planted in each of the old pits. As evening falls, we make it back to the home of our guide, Mr. Dida, and his wife. A special thanks going to a very special nephew. From here, they run a small showroom along with a cutting workshop. There is an obvious sense of pride in their stones, and it is not hard to see the love they have for the treasures that their homeland produces. Arriving back in Antananarivo, we decided to move away from the local scene in search of an emerging high-end market. It is apparent that in most cases, this is being spearheaded by the expat community.
Though many would assume otherwise, there are a number of companies with a strong focus on building the industry within Madagascar. This provides stable job opportunities, training to become skilled labourers, and vitally, it helps to keep a larger percentage of the profits generated within the community. Another vital aspect of improving the industry is not only adding value to the gems, but adding value to the people themselves. A general understanding of the fundamentals of field gemology, along with basic equipment, can make an incredible difference. With a greater understanding of their product, not only are they able to better negotiate with some of the more unscrupulous international dealers, but they gain a sense of pride and worth for what they are doing. From here, it is also important to advocate the need to pass on these skills. Therefore, part of the teaching process also involves how to transfer this knowledge base throughout as many other members of the community as possible. The Malagasy gem trade is still a very young market, and given political and socio-economic pressures, it has an uphill battle on its hands. However, with continued international support and the inspiring drive of its local people, there is definitely a bright future ahead for the unearthed treasures of Madagascar. <laughs>